these are some letters uh, written by Carl Korsh. Um, there's a couple of them, and they're kind of short, so I'm not going to make a different recording for each one. I'm just going to read them straight through. Uh, first letter is a letter to Paul Maddock, written from New York on November 20th, 1938. I am here on the third day of my sad journey to explore the present possibilities of work and influence on the Institute for Social Research. Up to now, it is clear that my two contributions, if at all, will appear in the sight shift through social forschung with such deletions and distortions that will, they will completely lose their real meaning. I would have taken them back long ago if I did not think that it would still be a certain advantage for both Panacook and Spain if they were taken by the journal in whatever distorted form. By the way, you are completely sure that one could name Panacook in print as the author of the Harper piece? Are you completely sure that one could name Panacook in print as the author of the Harper piece? If not, I would be glad to ask him directly right away. With living Marxism, it is not so bad, but the Zeitschrift is still read by bourgeois people in Holland. After conversations with the comrades around Con Major and Snevelet in Amsterdam in 1928, I had the impression that Panacook had given the Dutch government some sort of pledge not to engage in political activity, or not in Holland, not publicly, or something like that. Did he then sign the article on the organization question for living Marxism with his own name or with a pseudonym? After the first couple of long discussions with Horkheimer about plans to collaborate on a great book on dialectics, I am very skeptical. It appears that they want to use me approximately as they used you recently with your report on economics. They treat me with almost exaggerated respect, but that is only another form corresponding to my, quote, high, end quote, class position and the respect due to me in virtue of it. When nothing financial results from this, I shall probably in some way break off this partnership that is now viewed very positively from all sides an anonymous partnership insofar as I am in question, and that suits me fine. This is all in the deepest confidence completely between us. You can speak about it with Hans if you convey to him my request for the strictest absolute discretion. Pollock is truly kind and is positively interested in utilizing my power of production in some form, which would also be useful for me. But Pollock is completely immersed in the private capitalist business of the Institute and doesn't even take part in the discussions. Horkheimer is subjective, as I had already noticed in our discussions in Seattle, and in the last years has come very close to my, our political standpoint, but he is in no way ready to come out with his views publicly. The entire Institute has always been and still is completely grounded in a double bookkeeping in politics and revolutionary theory. It is not so bad as others, for example, the New School, who instead of offering their teaching positions to qualified and needy political immigrants like A. a Rosenberg, Hal Garten, and Korsch, question mark, hire rich people like Reitzler from Frankfurt or outspoken reactionaries like the Dolphus Viner Mayor Winter. There is a grotesque book by Winter that deserves a review in Living Marxism, and all financed by American Jews and anti-fascists. These people are the most disgusting scum that one can imagine. But the people, but the people from the Institute for Social Research think that because they are merely cowardly and egotistical and limited and not openly counter-revolutionary, that they are in some way revolutionary and ready for struggle in secret. Weisengrund Adorno is one of the most capable heads in philosophy, as Grossman is a luminary of economics. Wittfogel, too, despite his boredom with his field, may accomplish something scientific. Politically, he is still externally a Stalinist while the others only want to avoid a direct hostility with
with the Stalinists. Internally, they are all without exception in various degrees anti-Stalinist. Marcuse is a sort of orthodox Marxist who might even still be a Stalinist and is bureaucratically authoritarian in matters of bourgeois philosophy and Marxism, which today has become one and the same. Theoretically, he has somewhat more character and solidness than the others, whose greater, quote, freedom consists only in a greater fluctuation and uncertainty. But he is not especially sympathetic as a person. Leuventhal and Neumann are on the whole talented, personally decent writers, one, one in the field of literature and the other in jurisprudence. That is approximately the situation. They work but little and talk a lot. This they call, quote, collective work, end quote. In a definite hierarchy, each gives this other some chatter and then they conclude. They call, this they call community. I have talked to Grossman briefly for the first time yesterday at a Horkheimer University lecture whose circle of hearers was for the most part the people in, in the institute and their wives and a few confused students, more or less Stalinist influenced, far under the intellectual level of your circle in Chicago. I haven't yet been able to discuss your economic manuscript or living Marxism with him. In regard to support for the latter, it looks bleak. I mentioned it often in conversations, but have the impression that no one reads it, and that all of them have anxiety about it. At bottom, they have anxiety over it in general, although in fact no danger at all exists that they would be influenced or shaken in any way through reading our articles. According to a communication from Chapman and Hall, my book Karl Marx is to appear in London on November 7th, Concerning the American edition, they have submitted the work to Wiley and & Son and are waiting for the deci their decision. I can receive copies for four shillings apiece, bookstore prices six shillings, and have already ordered six copies. Perhaps you can already announce in this number of living Marxism that the book has appeared and is available for the bookstore price expressed in dollars. If you think that is all right, and would not prefer to wait until Wiley has made his decision, so as to eventually deal with him, let me know. I shall then order a number of copies from Chapman, and will have him send them to me in Chicago at your address. I shall speak with Sidney Hook Friday evening, and think that I, had, I shall also call Louis Corey and some others to make appointments. Bolka is still doing well, and I'm looking him up. Maybe he'll call me in the meantime. I am always at home until 10 a.m. He can also leave a message for me with Frau Lucy Bernhardy, where I live. Greetings to all friends. If I still had money, I would probably come to Chicago very soon. In fact, I am thinking of coming in a month or so for a couple of weeks. Write me. When is living Marxism appearing? Yours, Carl Korsch. P.S. I received Modern Quarterly in Boston before my trip. Thanks a lot. Garrett understands nothing about class struggle. From the materialist standpoint, it is not a question of what people are thinking in their heads, quote, struggle against religion, etc., end quote, but what they are and do. From Garrett's presentation, it follows that the sole counterforce to Franco, Negrin, Mussolini, Hitler, Chamberlain, etc., is the proletariat, that is active in Spain, that is latent internationally, and in Russia, ambiguous. The church and order in Spain represent a great part of capital, more directly than elsewhere. Thus, quote, struggle against religion, etc., end quote, is a more direct struggle against capital, and so on. Translated by Douglas Kellner. A letter to Bertolt Brecht from Boston, April 18th, 1947. Dear Brecht, it will soon hardly seem true that we are both living on the same continent and in the same country. Hence, I want to report to you today on the present situation and perspectives, sort of in the sense of one of Marx's young Hegelian friends who wrote a pamphlet, The Good Cause of Freedom and My Cause. Since I saw you last, things have not been going well for me. I have been working little, 
and what I have done has led to nothing, or at best like the study I began... I had begun earlier of the Philippines and the other struggles between the new colonialism and the new struggles for independence in the Far East to a new, quote, self-realization, end quote. After that, I broke off this work as well and occupied myself with various minor projects, among them the study of Toynbee in whom, unlike earlier, nothing now seems to me to be great except his weakness. Precisely for that reason, he is becoming popular, and in the May issue of Politics, I will perhaps discuss critically the new condensation of Toynbee's work, works into one volume, six in one, formally not badly done, and perhaps to be recommended to you for reading after all. Perhaps it has become... Oh, excuse me. Meanwhile, it has become quite clear to me that on the worldwide scale... We're in an era of regression. The retrogression in intellectual and cultural matters can be traced almost from day to day. It is also useless to point to the continuing, quote, progress, end quote, of technology. On the contrary, the intellectual decline will reach an extent in the foreseeable future which will bring even the progress of technology to a halt. And even now, the already threadbare foundations for nearly equating the progress of technology and that of material production are disappearing more and more. Nothing is changed in this overall picture by the regions of the world where material progress is still continuing or only really beginning, on the one hand Russia, on the other China, and with several question marks, India. It is as in the Roman Empire, from roughly the 2nd or 3rd century on, where even in the most remote province a certain resistance was waged against the loss of culture, and beyond the borders, the construction of a new world had begun amongst the, quote, barbarians, end quote. But how difficult it was already for Engels, even for a much later time, to, quote, prove, end quote, that feudal society represented a, quote, progressive epoch of the formation of economic society, end quote, vis-a-vis -vis ancient society, that is, a higher development from slave labor to serfdom. Today, we know that slavery existed in all historical forms of society, and that it played a very different role in each, for example, in Chinese society, a very small one in relation to the state statute labor, corvées, required by the state. On the one hand, and the various free and semi-free forms of labor in the fragmented rural economy, on the other. In many other ways, the old Marxian, really Hegelian model has fallen into disorder today. Even earlier, however, it did not fit the relationship between, me between medieval and ancient society. In this general retrogression, I have finally decided to take a step backward also and begin anew with Marx. His activity in the period from 1848 to 1867, the Communist Manifesto to Capital, or Revolution of 1848 to the First International, now seems to me, in fact, to be the classical form for the development of Marxian theory and action, as well as for the entire bourgeois era, which began in the 16th century, in part even earlier in Europe, and attained its culmination at this time. Having taken this step, I am overflowing with new thoughts and plans for work. There seems to be a very there seems to be a way of presenting Marxism which I have not yet properly tried out. If, for example, I wanted to write something for the one hundredth birthday of the Communist Manifesto written in December eighteen forty seven, published in February eighteen forty eight, it would no it would no longer be of importance to present its genesis exactly, as has been done by many good scholars on other memorial days, and as I myself, for example, did rather extensively for the theory of capital in my last book. The important thing now is presenting the century of the Communist Manifesto, or perhaps even the first Marxism century, proceeding from the classical form, the various challenges which this Finnish theory subsequently met and how it reacted to them. Here belong also the new problems appearing within the theoretical work of Marx himself. The details of, quote, classical, end quote, bourgeois economics, 
and its, quote, positive, end quote, extensions, particularly by the English theorists Peking and Richard Jones, who nearly matches Marx. They are, however, treated under the heading, quote, antitheses to the economists on the basis of the Ricardo theory, end quote, in the third volume of the so-called Theories on Surplus Value, edited by Kautsky. Two, similarly, the problem of Hegelian and post-Hegelian dialectics recurring in the work on economic theory and previously declared, quote, overcome, end quote, by Marx, but not solved concretely at all up to that point. Three, Later, especially problems of agricultural economy, America, Russia, Asian society. Four, perhaps less important for Marx than for Engels, prehistory. Five, very late and unfortunately attested in the main only in Engels' formulations, the problems of monopoly capitalism and so-called state capitalism, whose clarification and solution was, in my opinion, possible in large part at the time on the basis of the Marxian theory of, quote, commodity fetishism, end quote. In addition to historical, three, practical challenges, which to a greater extent than the theoretical ones, have led not merely to a further development, but also to, to a kind of disintegration of the Marxian theory. Here belong the experiences of the first international in England, the discussion of the labor unions from all direct or indirect necessary connection with the revolutionary movement in southern France, Switzerland, Italy, Spain, anarchism, analogous and in part overlapping, the non-suitability of classical Marxian theory for the non-industrialized countries, which was not merely negatively symbolized but made clear for positive further development in the struggle against Bakunin, Slavic countries of Europe, Asia, analogous unsuitability for America, the Commune Revolt, the American Civil War, the potentially revolutionary crisis of the 60s in Russia, then the renewed bogging down of all these impulses and the reaction against them, Third Republic in France, Marx's democratic foreign policy, national wars, foundation of the German Reich, the emergence of national social democratic parties in France and Germany, temporarily somewhat earlier, Marx's overwhelming reformist reaction to the English factory legislation, proletarian dictatorship or democracy, the, quote, withering away of the state, end quote, role of the, quote, party, struggle for the reception of revolutionary theory by non-revolutionary movements, organizations, end quote, elites, end quote, differing developments in Germany, France, and Russia, end of this epoch at beginning of the 80s, 1880s. This new epoch since 1890 is perhaps best not treated in this book, or, question mark? Additionally, I would like to say that some things have now changed in my position toward Russia and thus indirectly towards the Communist Party. In spite of the frightful brutalities in the occupied areas and even more in Russia itself, all in all, the perspectives for the economic and political regions in the Russian sphere of influence seem better or at least less desperate than for those in the areas of Western dominance. Even the, quote, United States of Europe, end quote, would come into being under this leadership only in the form drastically represented by Franco Spain on the one hand and the present Greek government on the other. After all, I have seen quite clearly from my careful studies of the Far Eastern movements that Russia is the best and at the same time the only ally for these countries, even if it actually does nothing for them and forces their independent movements without equivalent concessions into its own forms, which serve quite different purposes. A worldwide hegemony of the Yankees would, not only, would be not only the worst thing I could imagine for this world, but beyond that, merely a reactionary utopia. Imperialism has to be learned. And for a long time, the Americans, in contrast to the Britons, would only bumble around with this task, and the rest of the world would have to suffer not only from American imperialism, but also from the deficient development of this imperialism. Put another way, previous U.S. imperialism in the Caribbean region, in Central and Southern and South, in Central and South America, and probably also in its impending forms in Japan, 
will not even serve the interest of U.S. capitalism as a whole, but instead only a relatively small group of colonial Praetorian exploiters. In all these respects, Russian imperialism is better for the world today than Yankee imperialism, and there is hardly a third chance. The forms in which the non-ruling secondary peripheral, quote, national minorities, end quote, within the Russian Empire are likewise subjected to a special quasi-colonial repression and exploitation are obviously still very little developed and show more a factual than a systematic discrimination. The coercive measures applied against the entire citizenry, for example, mass, mass deportations, forced labor camps, and other physical and social measures against insufficiently dependable segments of the population, are of course more effective, that is, more destructive, when they are applied against such externally segregated, less densely populated, and professionally and socially less differentiated regions, where, for example, entire states can be annulled as such and their populations moved away. The repressive and exploitative element in the rule of bordering areas, Balkans, Czechoslovakia, etc., Poland, occupied zone of Germany, is easier to show, but so far has constituted only a subordinate, and not necessarily the dominant factor in the character of these forms of government. These reflections I have just inserted here have only a little to do with my return to the study of Marx. They serve more as a supplement to the first part of the letter, where I deal with the situation of the world as a whole, and in the historical comparison with the decline of the Roman Empire, did not expressly take into account the fact that the Russian world today is in a quite different position from that of the, quote, barbarians, end quote, outside the Roman imperial boundaries back then. But it is true for both times that the construction of the new world has begun crudely, and it cannot even be said as definitely today for the future, as we can presently say it for the past era, that this new world, no matter how it may be in other respects, will really develop as a, quote, new, end quote, world in contrast to the old one, and that it will not be brought back again into the old one, like the East Roman Empire in relation to the West Roman Empire. Finally, two more personal points. Please write and tell me how long you plan to stay in the West this year. I would perhaps come to Los Angeles for a short time in August, partly to visit you, partly to visit the gentlemen from the Institute who have been developing an ever more, quote, Western, end quote, orientation, first of all, geographically. And as much as I would enjoy seeing the rest of the Brecht family, if I take away Steph, whom I have here, and you, in case you were gone by then, whether I would still find you there has some importance for my decision. Hannah and I want to fly to Mexico in the beginning of September. I could, however, come to Los Angeles before then. The second point leads me back to the Communist Manifesto. It seems to me that it would be nice if you could get your didactic poem finished by October or November of this year so that it could be published in time for the 100th anniversary of the Communist Manifesto. I would like to cooperate in one way or another, since it would probably be more correct not to print the text of the manifesto along with it, perhaps a small introduction would be in order which I could, crossed out handwritten edition, Ill illegible, alone or together with me. And secondly, I would very much like to write a concentrated presentation in German of the thoughts just discussed, but expanded upon everywhere, and suited to the occasion, with a smaller dose of explicit criticism, which could be published as the second part of the new book. To appear in this, in this good company would be so important to me that I would, if necessary, write anonymously or under a pseudonym. At the same time, I am writing the work discussed above, more in detail and probably in English, and if at all possible, so that it will be ready for print by the end of this year. Just now, however, it is difficult for me to go beyond the stage of good thoughts and all the other forms of pure, quote, brain work to the real writing. To gather the completeness I previously considered necessary, and I can only adapt with difficulty to these further consequences of the current regressive development of the world. But even in Moscow, where formerly everything is assembled, I fear that it would firstly not be available at all, and secondly no longer for me in the same way as it was in, the, in an earlier period. Stalin's recent statement that, quote, 
even the classics can air, end quote, and expressly including, quote, the socialist classics, end quote, as well, opens, of course, everything but the prospect for a greater tolerance towards historical criticism. which, after all, did not begin for the Holy Scripture of the Bible until the 19th century, and then only for Europe, but has not yet begun and even today for America, with many cordial greetings from one house to another, your old Karl Korsch. P.S. I won't even read my stenogram through, but will send it immediately to Hannah, with the request to send you and me one copy each. P.P.S. As may have occurred to you by yourself while reading, I will soon be needing again my copy of Engel's Catechism, The Principles of Communism, of October 1847. Luckily, however, I can refer you to the fact that this work is printed with all the more or less important corrections and deletions of the original manuscript in the Marx Engels Gesamtausgabe, 16, pages 501-22. Both of the admitted answers to the questions 22 and 23 are not to be found there either. According to the addition's assertion on page 682, they are, quote, not extant. Translated by Mark Ritter. Letter to J.A. Dawson, who was an Australian council communist, from Boston, Massachusetts, USA, on the May on May third, nineteen forty eight. Dear friend, though it might have been wiser to look through the last issues of your paper first, I decided not to postpone any longer my long delayed plan of writing to you directly. Up to now I heard from you only indirectly, and I read with interest such issues of your paper as were given to me either by my friend Paul Maddock or by the Boston friends who published the Western Socialist. You need not be told, I think, that my connection with the latter is merely personal and is not based on any theoretical or political agreement. What separates us can perhaps be most easily expressed by the phrase which I kept repeating to my dear friend George Gloss, that his group represents at best the ideas of the revolution of the 19th century, while I am only interested in that of the 20th century. Maybe I should state first, in detail, who I am, and give you a historical analysis of the long development through which I changed from a member, though an oppositionist member even then, of the English Fabian Society in 1912 to 1914 to a member of the German Independent Social Democratic Party during the First World War, and then from there, through a short enthusiastic adherence to the party of Lenin, to a, quote, ultra-leftist, end quote, opposition, first from within, afterwards from without the party, and from there further on, during the last 20 years, to a new position, which seems to me in many ways similar to your present tendency, as reflected by your issue of December 1947. The last so far, as I have seen, I think, however, that you are more or less aware of all the relevant shades of the present development, and thus probably know more about me than I could tell you in a short letter. I should not neglect, though, to tell you that I enjoyed your reprinting my review of Trotsky's book in so many pieces by Maddock and Panacook. Just now I should be busy writing a review of the English edition of Panacook's excellent criticism of Lenin's philosophy for the Western Socialists. Yet I find it difficult to do so, since I said most of the things I had to say in my earlier review of the German text that appeared in Volume 4, Number 5 of Living Marxism in 1938. If I wanted to prove, if I wanted to improve on that now, after 10 years, I would have to deal with the newest attack of positivism against Marxism that is contained in Karl Popper's two volumes on the Open Society and its enemies that appeared in London in 1945, and which I got only now, after it had been reprinted in 1947. I find this book very loathsome, however, though it is ably written and has made a deplorably strong impression on some former leftists of the panacook matic group. Thus I find it difficult to make me read it through. And this again, up to now, has kept me from writing the review I had promised both to Maddock and the Western Socialists for the purpose of promoting the sale of Panacook's valuable book. 
if and when I write the review, I shall send you a copy forth, with, since it is quite possible that the Western Socialists will find my review, quote, too academical and too confused, end quote, again, as they did in regard to my review of Trotsky's book, and I really cannot blame them for thinking so from their own particular viewpoint. I am absorbed at present in two different kinds of studies which will appear first in the German language and in which I try to trace both the final results of the, quote, Marxist era of the workers' movement to the original theory and practice of Marx. One, before, during, and after 1848. Two, during the period of the International Workingmen's Association in the 60s and 70s, I'll send you copies of what is ready as soon as I manage to translate it into English, in case you can get German SSS, or German MSS, translated down under, I'd send you quite a selection of new and old writings which might be of interest to you, but I am afraid that cannot be done, and it is well nigh impossible for me to get copies of my English writings of the last 10 to 15 years myself. In connection with the above described studies, I plan to write on the theories of Bakunin, and more particularly on his theory of the state as presented in a book of 1873, which is widely unknown and does not exist in any non-Russian edition except in one of the Spanish editions, which is nearly unobtainable too. Thus it will take some time before I overcome the linguistic difficulties. I learnt Spanish now and can read the Spanish translation myself, but I need help for the original Russian version, and I have to get photostatic copies of it because I can borrow the book itself only for a limited period, which is nearly exhausted. There are a few articles in which I deal dealt with the subject in the German periodical, Die Aktion, in 1928 and 1931, but they have not been translated. So I was quite glad when Lane Diaz sent me an article on the interpretation of the Paris Commune, and I translated it into English myself, first from a French translation and now from the Spanish original version, which turned out to be far better than the French version. I also made a few changes with the consent of the author, whom I did not know in person. I enclose a copy of this article with a view to publication in your paper, if you think that you can do so. In spite of certain obvious shortcomings, I think that the little article is well written and approaches certain important questions in a manner which might interest people who have not yet freed themselves from the Marx-Lenin-Trotsky legacy legend. Oh, excuse me. I think that the little article is well written and approaches certain important questions in a manner which might interest people who have not yet freed themselves from the Marx-Lenin-Trotsky legend to the same extent as you or I might claim it for ourselves. Comradely greetings, Karl Korsch. Letter to Eric Gerlach, written December 16th, 1956. I am ashamed that I have not written you for such a long time after our conversations in Hanover and after receiving the two issues of Sozialistische Politik of July and August 1956. I have immediately read in detail here both issues and found almost everything within extraordinarily good and useful as preparation for the new socialism of a German and European workers' movement that appears to me completely non-utopian. I would thus be glad to write occasionally for the journal, but that which in this activity could precisely be most important for us, a continuous comparison and synthesis between the workers' movement here that has already developed further and your European experiences, I could not carry out for a long time in the disappointment and depressed condition after my return from the trip to Europe, even though I produced some contacts and really tried every day to see the possible connections between the developments there and here. What happened is that I came up with an immense amount of material here, which had been gathered during my absence and has since increased more before I could go, I could work through the earlier material. Further, my old habit of 40 years of going back and forth from theory to practice has been considerably reinforced by the present events in Russia, Poland, and other so-called satellites. 
even in order to, quote, see together, end quote, these last events in the context of a great Middle European development, I need a renewed purely theoretical study of this entire epoch, and especially its present development that has been so violently mutilated before its maturity. I shall report again to you on these questions after some time when my, quote, self-understanding, end quote, has progressed further. Despite my previous neglect, I am very excited about your answer to the statements in this letter and the present position and perspective from the standpoint of socialist politics. In the meantime, I send you, along with Hedas, our warm greetings, naturally to your wife also. Is there any chance that you might come to America sometime? Yours, Carl Korsch. On a letter written on the same day to Root Fisher, which Korsh included in the letter to Gerlach, he writes, I traveled to Detroit. After a quick decision to participate in a mass meeting of auto workers, I had a good reception from old and new friends, but the time was too short to build anything further. For me, in, the U in my U.S. desert, it is already a lot when I am once again among real workers. As always, I have good plans to activate my theoretical and political tendencies, but hold on at the same time to another dream to theoretically restore the ideas of Marx that today are seemingly annihilated after the conclusion of the Marx-Lenin-Stalin episode. Translated by Douglas Kellner.